Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the response to JW Comments, Questions, and Objections playlist and is entitled episode number 31. Before we begin, a short prayer. A blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God, and the errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak, or any scripture that I interpret correctly, is welcomed in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. It's a set of comments from our brother Ben Z, who's an XJW. It's to the video above. The first one, I will, is really describing Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. It sounds like the God of the Watchtower is Satan, cleverly described, disguised, right, as the God of the Bible. Satan will be, is already the God of this world, but not for long. Once the new world order begins, he won't be worshipped for long. JWs actually serve Satan, and they're not aware of it. They don't declare Jesus Christ, as per Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. They declare Jehovah and his organization. And then his second comment. Another XJW brought that connection to my attention, but it's spot on, involving the I will related to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, which we're going to get into here in a moment. Additionally, JW say the theme of the Bible is the sanctification of Jehovah's name, which Alice Bailey and Helena Blavatsky view as Satan. That's how Luciferians view Satan, that he's actually misunderstood and has a bad reputation, that Satan was actually trying to help mankind. It's interesting connecting the dots. So here we got the New World Translation from the Watchtower. We have Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So God said to Moses, I will become what I choose to become. And he added, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I will become has sent me to you. Again, pretty much every single English translation of Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 says not I will become what I choose to become, but I am that I am or something like that. Below you see the Septuagint. That's the Koine Greek rendering of the Hebrew by Greek-speaking Jewish scribes at least 200 years before the time of Lord Jesus. So I will become, in the Koine Greek, is I am. What I choose to become would be O'on. Now, I will become what I choose to become. I'm going to change into something. I will become. Really? Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am Jehovah. I do not change. I don't become anything different. I will become what I choose to become. That is not Jehovah. And you are sons of Jacob. You have not yet come to your finish. Again, I will become on again. Now, what's funny is if you're going to render it this way as a translator. Obviously, aren't you going to look at the Septuagint and other things? So, again, render, I am that I am. I will become what I choose to become. I will become has sent me to you. Well, shouldn't it be what I choose to become has sent me to you? I'm kind of being silly there. Now, they know what o'on means. They know what ero emi o'on means in Koine Greek. Why do I say that? This is actually if they're true translators. We have on the right, excuse me, on the left, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, and then the uh, uh, Greek interlinear below. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says Jehovah God, the one who is, and who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. And then you see below, Ero emi to Alpha ke to Omega, legi kirios o theos, o on ke o in ke o erhomenos o pantokrator. So notice, I am, Ero emi, the one who is, o on. The one who was, o in, the one who is coming, o erhomenos. So they should know that ero emi, o on, should be translated, I am the living one, I am the being, I am the one who is, which is probably the most appropriate rendering of the verse, at least looking at the Septuagint and the Koine Greek in the New Testament. Revelation 22. Verses 12 to 13, in terms of the Alpha and Omega reference. Look, I am coming quickly, and the reward I give is with me to repeat each one according to his work. Next verse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So obviously, whoever's speaking in verse 12 is verse, excuse me, is speaking in verse 13 and is declaring himself to be the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. So who's speaking in verse 12? 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, for the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he, the Son of Man, will repay each one according to his behavior. Hmm. So, looks like it's the Son of Man speaking in Revelation chapter 22, 12, and therefore declaring himself the Alpha and the Omega in verse 13. More evidence of that? John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. For the Father judges no one at all, but he has entrusted all the judging to the Son. So the Son does all the judging. The Son is speaking in Revelation 22, 12. Therefore, the Son is declaring himself Alpha and Omega in 13. And let's look at verse 23 of John chapter 5. So that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father, identical to how they honor the Father. The same is how they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Notice, if you're a traditional Trinitarian Christian, you honor the Father and the Son equally. They're both your God. You honor them. You praise them. You worship them. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you do not honor them the same, and therefore you honor no one. Now, getting to the Isaiah chapter 14 reference that started the video with Ben Z. Again, I will become what I choose to become is their rendering of the ego amio on the I am that I am. I will become how wicked. Let's look at verses 12 to 14. This is most likely Satan speaking. It never specifically states it, but looking at the whole Bible, this would be Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O shining one, son of the dawn. How you have been cut down to the earth, you who vanquished nations. You said in your eye, I will ascend to the heavens above the stars of God. I will lift up my throne, and I will sit down on the mountain of meeting in the remotest parts of the north. I will go up above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself resemble the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the grave to the remotest parts of the pit. So notice here's Satan speaking. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And here's God telling what's really going to happen. No, you will, again, be brought down to the grave to Hades, to Sheol, to the remotest parts of the pit. And by the way, when you see what this means, it proves that their whole thought of the grave being just the grave is false. It's a spiritual dimension of torment. Because that's where Satan is thrown down into, into this pit. And we'll look at that in the book of Revelation as the talk progresses. Now, let's go into Satan the serpent in the Bible, in the New World Translation of the Bible. So, Genesis chapter 3. Here's the serpent, which we learn in Revelation 12, is obviously Satan. Here's Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now, the serpent was the most cautious of all the wild animals of the field that Jehovah God had made. So it said to the woman, Did God really say to you, Must not eat from every tree of the garden? At this the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God has said about the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, You must not eat from it. No, you must not touch it, otherwise you will die. At this the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die, for God knows that the very day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and bad. So again, who wants to become God? Who wants to change to become like God? It's Satan, and he's tempting the woman, who we later uh, learn her name is Eve, with that same issue. Notice, though, how does the Watchtower translator describe the serpent Satan as being cautious? Cautious. Hmm. Let's look at every other English translation. Crafty, shrewdest, crafty, crafty. It's cunning, crafty, 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 subtle, skilled in deceit. Cunning, cunning, sneakier, cunning. Clever, clever, shrewd, subtle, cunning, subtle, shrewd. Subtle, 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 cunning. Crafty, subtle, subtle. Subtle, subtler, soitler, soitler. Cunning, subtle, crafty. Subtle, crafty. Craftier, subtle. Subtle, crafty. So notice how every English translation describes the serpent, and they in the watchtower describe him as cautious. Hmm, interesting. Continuing verses 13 through 15 here. Jehovah God then sent to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman replied, The serpent deceived me, so I ate. Then Jehovah God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are the cursed one out of all the domestic animals and of all the wild animals of the field. On your belly you will go, and you will eat dust 
all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or your seed and her offspring or her seed. And we learn obviously in the New Testament that her seed, because again, seed in the Greek would be spermatos, sperm. Women don't have seed, men have seed. So who's the only woman who had seed? The woman who didn't have an earthly father. That was the offspring. So that's obviously a um, prophecy of Lord Jesus to be born in the future. He will, the seed of the woman, Lord Jesus Christ, right? He will crush your head and you will strike him in the heel. I actually like that rendering there. He, you, he will. Lord Jesus will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike him in the heel, which was probably a reference to you know him, the nail being thrust into his heels on Golgotha. Job chapter one, let's again, all of this in the New York Translation. Again, a reference of Satan. Verses six through 10 here. Now the day came when the sons of the true God, these angelic spirit beings obviously, entered to take their station before Jehovah and Satan also entered among them. Then Jehovah said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered Jehovah, from roving about on the earth and from walking about in it. And Jehovah said to Satan, have you taken note of my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. He is an upright man of integrity, fearing God and shunning what is bad. At that, Satan answered Jehovah, is it for nothing that Job has feared God? Have you not put up a protective hedge around him and his house and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands and his livestock has spread out in the land. So notice in front of these angelic spirit beings, Satan is not respecting God's judgment. God says, Job is this good servant, and Satan says, ah, he's only a good servant because you protect him. Notice he's, he's mocking God, and he's questioning God's judgments, again, in front of angelic spirit beings. Continuing, verses 11 through 12, but for a chain, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your very face. Then Jehovah said to Satan, look, everything that he has is in your hand, only do not lay your hand on the man himself. So Satan went out from the presence of Jehovah. So notice Satan mocks God, Satan questions God's judgment, and guess what? Satan's wrong. He was wrong about what he told Eve because she did die physically later and spiritually probably then. And notice what he's saying. If you take this away, he's gonna curse you to your face. Well, Job never curses God to his face. Satan was wrong. He was a mocker, he was a disrespecter, and he was wrong. Job chapter two, verses one through four here. Afterward, the day came when the sons of the true God, right, the angelic spirit kings, entered to take their station again before Jehovah, and Satan also entered among them to take his station before Jehovah. Then Jehovah said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered Jehovah, from roving about on the earth and from walking about in it. And Jehovah said to Satan, have you taken note of my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth. He is an upright man of integrity, fearing God and shunning what is bad. He is still holding firmly to his integrity, even though you try to incite me against him to destroy him for no reason. But Satan answered Jehovah, skin for skin, a man will give everything that he has for his life. Notice, Satan was wrong, proven wrong, and he just goes on to another point. I'm sure you've met people like this. But for a change, stretch out your hand and strike his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your very face. Then Jehovah said to Satan, look, he is in your hand, only do not take his life. So Satan went out from the presence of Jehovah and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. So notice, yet again, he's wrong and it doesn't matter. He continues mocking. He continues questioning God's judgments. And again, he's wrong. Notice the end of it, though. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Whenever you read the Bible, look at everything as a picture of Lord Jesus. From the sole of his foot, right? We know he was struck, nails through his foot, there was all the references to worshiping him at his feet. There was washing of the feet. There was the anointing of his feet by Mary, etc. And the crown of his head, think of the crown of thorns, obviously. Ezekiel chapter 28. Again, it doesn't specifically say Satan, but looking at the Bible in hold, this is referring to Satan. Verses 11 through 13 here. And the word of Jehovah came again to me saying, son of man, sing a dirge concerning the king of Tyre and tell him this is what the sovereign Lord Jehovah says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So you'd say, well, this is talking about the king of Tyre. But look at the next verse. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Uh-oh, the king of Tyre was not there. You were adorned with every precious stone, ruby, topaz, and jasper, chrysolite, onyx, and jade, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and their settings and mountains were made of gold. They were prepared on the day you were created. So this is some created, you're gonna see wicked being in the Garden of Eden, obviously the serpent. Notice he was created. 
The word is uh, a derivative of Hebrew Strong's 1254, Hibara Aka, you were created. Where is that particular word first used? The Hebrew Strong's word 1254, Bara, in Genesis 1 1, in terms of God creating the heaven and the earth. So notice, God created the heaven and the earth, and Satan was created. Let's compare that to Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Jehovah produced me as the beginning of his way, the earliest of his achievements of long ago. From ancient times I was installed, from the start from times earlier than the earth, where there were no deep waters I was brought forth, when there were no springs overflowing with water. Before the mountains were set in place, before the hills, I was brought forth. This is about wisdom. Many of us, Jehovah's Witnesses and traditional Trinitarian Christians, believe this very well may be a reference to Lord Jesus Christ, but there's nothing in the New Testament that directly connects it. But the point is, there's no creation here. These are different Hebrew Strong's word. Possessed me, that's Kanani, that's Hebrew Strong 7069. I have been established, Nisakati, uh, Hebrew Strong's 5258, and the next to I was brought forth, Hebrew Strong's 2342, Hawala Leti. Now what's interesting about this is let's compare Psalm 102 to Hebrews chapter one. Psalm 102, go study it. It is a Psalm to Lord Jehovah. Let's look at verses 25 to 27. Long ago you, sovereign Lord Jehovah, laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. Just like a garment, they will all wear out. Just like clothing, you will replace them and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years will never end. Let's compare that to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Again, go look at it, go study. This is the Father speaking to the Son. And this is the Father speaking to the Son. At the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out. And you will wrap them up just as a cloak and as a garment, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. So notice the Father is calling the Son Jehovah, calling him Creator. So remember when you look at all these verses talking about the heavens and the earth being by the Son, it's not that the Son was used as a tool by the Father. It means by His hands. He was creator together with the Father and the Spirit. He's being called Jehovah, basically, by the Father. And the Father is quoting Psalm 102 about the Son, and Psalm 102 is about Lord God, proving Lord Jesus is also Lord God together with His Father and their Spirit. Ezekiel 28, going back to that, verses 14 to 16, I signed you as the anointed covering cherub. You were on the holy mountain of God and you walked about among fiery stones. You were faultless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Because of your abundant trade, you became filled with violence and you began to sin. So I will cast you out as profane for the mountain of God and destroy you, O covering cherub, away from the stones of fire. So he's the anointed covering cherub. Question, what was this covering cherub doing? It's never explicitly stated, but the belief is possibly he was covering the throne of God and thereby reflecting back the glory of God. So notice it's Satan, it appears, this covering cherub who reflects back the glory of God. Remember that, continuing Verses 17 through 19. Your heart became haughty because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your own glorious splendor. I will throw you down to the earth. I will make you a spectacle before kings because of your great guilt and your dishonest trading. You have profaned your sanctuaries. I will cause a fire to break out in your midst and it will consume you. I will reduce you to ashes on the earth before all those looking at you. All who knew you among the peoples will stare at you in amazement. Your end will be sudden and terrible and you will cease to exist for all time. So again, we saw in Isaiah 14, he's going to be thrown down to the pit, right? What's going to happen here? I will throw you down to the earth. I will make you a spectacle before kings. I will cause a fire to break out in your midst and it will consume you. I will reduce you to ashes on the earth before all those looking at you. All who knew you among the peoples will stare at you in amazement. Your end will be sudden and terrible and you will cease to exist for all time. So again, when we get in the book of Revelation, we're going to see when this happens. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit 
up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So notice who's going to be tempted is Lord Jesus. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he felt hungry. And the tempter, right, Satan, approached and said to him, if you are a son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man must live not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from Jehovah's mouth. Um, notice, again, Satan. He's mocking Lord Jesus. He mocked Lord God, and he's mocking Lord Jesus. Notice what he says, if you are the Son of God. Look at how all the demons in the New Testament interact with Lord Jesus. Do they ever question who he is? No, they know who he is. They just want him to not throw them into the pit and to leave them be until the judgment day, basically, right? Continuing verses 5 through 7, Then the devil took him along into the holy city, and he stationed him on the battlement of the temple and said to him, If you are a son of God, it's not if you are a, uh, it's if you are the Son of God. Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels a command concerning you, and they will carry you on their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. That's a reference to um, Psalms chapter 91. By the way, he quotes two verses and doesn't quote the next verse about this individual being spoken of, Lord Jesus crushing the head of the serpent. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You must not put Jehovah your God to the test. It actually says, You will not tempt the Lord your God. So wait, wait, hold on a second here. This again proves Lord Jesus is God, and he's declaring it right there. How, how so? In verse 1, it says, Lord Jesus was to be tempted of the devil. Well, notice what Lord Jesus says to the devil. You must not tempt the Lord your God. Well, who was being tempted was Lord Jesus. That is basically Lord Jesus saying, hey, Satan, don't tempt me. I'm the Lord your God. And by the way, here's those verses, Psalm 91, verses 11 through 13. For he will give his angels a command concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will carry you on their hands so you may not strike your foot against a stone. On the young lion and the cobra you will tread. You will trample underfoot the ma maned lion and the big snake. So we've seen some principles of Satan. Number one is the mock, the question God's judgment. And when they're proven wrong, they won't admit they were wrong. They won't apologize. They'll just keep going. And there's another satanic thing, partially quoting scripture to change the meaning. Notice Satan quoted verses 11 through 12. He didn't quote verse 13. And isn't it interesting? What does verse 13 show? That Lord Jesus being spoken of in verses 11 and 12 will crush the head of the cobra, will crush the big snake. And obviously those are references to Satan himself. Going back to Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, again, the devil took him along to an unusually high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and do an act of worship to me and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go away, Satan, for it is written, it is Jehovah your God you must worship, and it is to him alone you must render sacred service. So there's a few interesting things here. Number one, notice when the devil said, I have all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Did Jesus say, no, you don't, Satan, they're mine. He acknowledged it. So at that time and right now, because God allows it, he's the prince of the air, this world is under the sway of the devil um, for the greater purposes of Lord God. And then notice this, only God can be worshiped. Only God can be worshiped. We'd all agree, right? Well, in the Greek, notice, Proskinesis, do an act of worship. Proskinesis, do an act of worship or shall worship. And then, by the way, you shall render sacred service, latreusis. So remember that. That's what it means. So proskinesis means worship. It doesn't mean something else. Okay, remember that because you're going to see how the Watchtower New World Translators are wicked and change things to lie, just like their father Satan, to poor Jehovah's Witnesses so they don't see the truth of the true Lord Jesus. Let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 10 here. At that I fell down, this is John, before the feet, his feet, this is an angel, to worship him. But he tells me, be careful, do not do that. I am only a fellow slave of you and of your brothers who have the work of witnessing concerning Jesus. Worship God, just like we saw in Matthew chapter 4. For the witness concerning Jesus is what inspires prophecy. And if you look, again, notice the word, worship God. Proskinise, worship, proskinison. Proskinesis, proskinesis, proskinise, proskinison. Worship, that's what that word means when used in the New Testament. Every time you'll see. 
Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 through 9. While I, John, was the one hearing and seeing these things, when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing me these things. But he tells me, be careful, do not do that. I'm only a fellow slave of you and your brothers, the prophets, and of those observing the words of this scroll. Worship God. And again in the Greek, proskinise, proskinison. So you're seeing over and over again, that particular Koine Greek word means worship, which it does. Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. And I heard every creature in heaven. What would that be? Angelic spirit beings, saved human perfected spirits, right? And on earth, human beings like us. Underneath the earth, demons, uh, uh, individuals in Hadesh, Sheol, who are not saved, right? Who are waiting for final judgment, the goats basically. And on the sea and all the things in them sank. So notice the exhaustive use of the language by St. John. That's every single created sentient being in heaven, on the earth, underneath the earth, and on the sea. And all the things in them. So that's every, everything in creation. Everything in creation. Saying to the one sitting on the throne, that's Almighty God, and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. So notice they're sharing blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And they're in one category, and the other category is creation. Proving what? They're uncreated. Well, if you're uncreated, you're God. Exactly. So Almighty God is God, right? But so is the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God who took on flesh. And then notice the next verse. The four living creatures were saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Who are they worshipping? They're worshipping the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb. They're getting blessing, they're getting honor, they're getting glory, and their might. They're getting it identically, just like John 5, 23 teaches, by the way. And notice they're being worshipped in the next verse. And yet again, prosekenisan. Uh, He's saying the Greek word again. It means worship. Acts chapter 10. Now it starts getting a little funky with these neural translators. As Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell down on his feet, and did obeisance to him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Rise, I too am just a man. So he's worshiping him, and Peter says, Don't worship me. We saw this with the angels and John in Revelation. And what's the word? The word is prosekenisen. It's the same word, so they're just playing. It means worship, and it fits in context. Cornelius was trying to worship Peter, and Peter said, don't worship me, worship God. What are you doing? I'm a man. Just like what the angel said to John. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 17. However, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had arranged for them to meet. When they saw him, they did obeisance, but some doubted. They worshipped him, prosekenisan, the exact same word. So notice they pick and choose when it means worship and when it doesn't. It always means worship, okay? And you'll notice who's allowed to have worship? Lord God and Lord Jesus. That's it. No one else is allowed worship. Men, and you'll see Satan and the beast of the sea and the false prophet are not allowed worshipped. Uh, neither were angels and neither was Peter. Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 4. And there will be, excuse me, and there will no longer be any curse. Just remember the last chapter of the final book of the Bible. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. Now it's a singular throne. It's the throne of God, Almighty God, and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will offer him sacred service. Now that's problematic. So there's the throne of God, one person, the throne of the Lamb, a separate person. It's one throne. And his slaves will offer him sacred service. So are his slaves, is that God's slaves? Is that the lamb's slaves? Is that both of their slaves? And again, offering him sacred service. Is that Almighty God's getting sacred service? Is that the lamb? Is that both? And they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. What does all this mean? All right. In the Greek, it's the rendering sacred service is that word we saw over there to the left in, uh, at the bottom there, latreusis. It's latreusin. So again, that's Matthew chapter 4, verse 10 on the left. And this is Revelation 22, verse 33. So he's getting that sacred service that's only allowed God. Hmm. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 15. I kept watching the visions of the night, and look, with the clouds of the heavens, someone like a son of man was coming, and he gained access to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him up close before that one. And to him, by the way, 
this in, in Daniel uh, chapter 7, several verses earlier, there were thrones cast down and, and Almighty God was there. And to him, right, and to him, which is the Son of Man, there was given rulership, honor, and a kingdom that the peoples, nations, and language groups should all serve him. So they're serving, they're providing this service, and you're going to see it sacred service, to the Son of Man. We know that's Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb. His rulership is an everlasting rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. And in the Septuagint, Koine Greek, it's Latreusa. So notice the Son of Man, Lord Jesus Christ, is getting sacred service. It's right there. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule as king forever and ever. Now, this Lord is obviously the Father, right, as Almighty God. Typically, in the Bible, when it says Lord, it refers to Lord Jesus Christ, not here. And typically, in the Bible, when it says God, it's referring to Almighty God, but there are verses where God refers to Lord Jesus Christ. But it's, notice it's very similar to what we saw in Revelation chapter 22. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. We saw in Revelation chapter 22, it was of God and of his Lamb, right, of the Lamb, forgive me, kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule as king forever and ever. So is he the Lord, Almighty God? Is he the Christ? Both? Well, we know it's both. Oh. Now about the face, remember, we saw, they're saying, they will see my face. Hmm, Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. This is the Father interacting with Moses. By the way, I'm not going to show it, but there's other times when Lord God interacts with Moses and Moses sees him face to face. So notice there's a Lord God whose face can be seen, and then over here, there's a Lord God whose face cannot be seen. But he added, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Going back to Revelation chapter 22, they're seeing his face. So whose face is that? Is that Almighty God's face? Well, according to Exodus 33, 20, you can't see Almighty God's face, at least a certain person of Almighty God, namely the Father, but you can see the Lamb's face. Getting back to the idea of the name, Exodus chapter 23, 21, pay attention to him, referring to the angel of the Lord, and we as New Testament, traditional Christian, Trinitarian believers understand that it was the angel of the Lord who was the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus. That was the person of the Son who, and the person of Lord Jesus, takes on flesh. Pay attention to him, the angel of the Lord, and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him. This is Lord God speaking to the Israelites. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Notice he's able to pardon sin, but only God can pardon sin, because my name is in him. My name the name of Almighty God is in him, is within his substance. Hmm, if it was his son and of the father, would that be his family name in him? Makes sense. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, For this very reason God, for unto God the Father, exalted him, Lord Jesus, to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. Other is not in the Greek. It says the name that is above every name. Other obviously wickedly added to change the meaning. What is the name above every name? Jehovah, I guess, right? There you go. The family name of Jehovah is given back to them. Uh, or does it mean Jesus Christ, that name is greater than the name of Jehovah? Or is it the secret, wonderful name alluded to back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, so he, referring to the Lord Jesus, has become better than the angels. Wait a minute, what does that prove? He's not an angel. <laughs> or again, he's not the archangel Michael. To the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs, he's inherited the family name. Who's in the family? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He inherited back the family name as a return to glory in heavy, heaven, excuse me, of what, Jehovah? Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will by no means go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God. Notice who's doing the writing of names, Lord Jesus, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that descends out of heaven from my God, that occurs in Revelation 21, and my own new name. So notice Lord Jesus is writing these names. Now, you'll say, hold on a second. Lord Jesus is talking about himself having a God. How can God have a God? Well, remember, Lord Jesus is a God-man, according to traditional Trinitarian theology, right? He's the divine person of the Son who took on flesh. So the God part of the God-man doesn't have the God, but the man does. We see this in uh, uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 27. We also see this in probably playing out in Psalm 22, verse 10. When Lord Jesus took on flesh in the womb of 
Mary, the Theotokos, at that point, since all flesh has a God, he, becoming humanity, joining with creation, had a God, and the Father became his God. So that's the human nature of Lord Jesus speaking there. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, Then I saw and looked the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with them 144,000 who have his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Revelation chapter 19, verse 12, His eyes are a fiery flame. Again, this is Lord Jesus the Lamb. And on his head are many diadems, because he's King of kings and Lord of lords. He has a name written that no one knows but he himself. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 2, The nations will see a righteousness, a woman, referring to uh, Jerusalem, and all kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name which Jehovah's own mouth will designate. And we know that, again, in the Old Testament, just like the pre-incarnate Jesus, uh, the divine son, who later took on flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, was the angel of the Lord. He's also the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord proceeds out of Jehovah's own mouth. So notice, the word of the Lord, Jehovah's own mouth, does these new names. Again, all references to the Son, to the Lamb, to Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 12, verses 23 to 26. Well, all the crowds were astounded and began to say, May this not perhaps be the Son of David? At hearing this, the Pharisees said, This fellow does not expel the demons, except by means of Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every king to divide against himself comes to ruin, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. In the same way, if Satan expels Satan, he has become divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 23. From that time forward, Jesus began explaining to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised up. At this, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Be kind to yourself, Lord. You will not have this happen to you at all. But turning his back, he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you think not God's thoughts, but those of men. So notice what is Lord Jesus doing? He's comparing Satan to someone who's what? Blocking the plan of God. This, so Satan in the Bible is not someone trying to help mankind. He's trying to thwart God's plan. And of course, God's plan is to help mankind. So thwarting God's plan is harming mankind. That's what Satan wants to do. Matthew 25 verse 34, then verse 41. Then the king will say to those on his right, to the sheep, come you who have been blessed by my Father, and here the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. So notice the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem was prepared for us at the beginning. And all that we're going through right now is playing through this so that those who truly love God and truly want to be with God will be with him in this kingdom prepared for us from the founding of the world. Look at verse 41, speaking to the goats. Then he will say to those on the left, go away from me, you who have been cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's Gehenna, the outer darkness, the second death, the final hell, the everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Yet again, the devil, Satan, is not uh, trying to help out God. He is basically an arrogant, proud fool who has created this amazing creation and with his own free will decided to go his own way. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 19. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are made subject to us by the use of your name. At that he, Lord Jesus, said to them, I see Satan already fallen like lightning from heaven. Look, I have given you the authority to trample underfoot serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. Satan's the enemy. And nothing at all will harm you. Now, for interest, if you look at Hebrew, so notice Satan is lightning falling from heaven, and heaven's what? A high place. Well, Barak is the Hebrew word for lightning, and Bama is the name for a high place. So Satan falling like lightning from heaven could be Barak Bama. Hmm. Coincidence? John chapter 13, verse 27. After Judas took the priest of bed, then Satan entered into him. So Jesus said to him, what you are doing, do it more quickly. So notice, it was Satan, evidently controlling Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, who betrayed Lord Jesus. Obviously not trying to help out God. Obviously God used his evil for good, but he was trying to harm Lord Jesus, harm the Son of God, mock God. 
John chapter 17, verse 12. When I was with them, I used to watch over them on account of your own name, which you have given me, and I have protected them. Not one of them is destroyed except the son of destruction or son of perdition, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, possessed by Satan. We see it happening in John chapter 13, verse 27. There's only one individual in scripture referred to as the son of destruction, son of perdition. That is the Antichrist figure, the beast of the sea, the wild beast. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Let no, no one need you astray in any way, because it, meaning the coming of Lord Jesus, the end of the world, will not come unless the apostasy comes first, unless the church will fall apart, and the man of lawlessness gets revealed, the son of destruction, the son of perdition. Again, only otherwise used for Judas Iscariot. He stands in opposition and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he sits down in the temple of God, publicly showing himself to be a God. It says to be God. Obviously, the temple of God is not built with hands. The temple of God is the church. So if the church falls into great apostasy, and then this Antichrist, son of destruction, son of perdition, beast of the sea figure, declares himself God in the church, that fallen church, it appears. Acts chapter 5, verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan emboldened you to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly hold back some of the price of the field? So notice, Peter is saying that Satan was influencing Ananias here to what? Lie to the Holy Spirit. Which suggests the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Do you lie to batteries? Do you lie to forces? No, you lie to people. Jude chapter 1, verse 9, But when Michael, the archangel, had a difference with the devil and was disputing about Moses' body, he did not dare to bring a judgment against him in abusive terms, but said, May Jehovah rebuke you. So go check out Matthew chapter 4. Remember, from a watchtower perspective, from their theology, the Archangel Michael is the Son of God. He is a created spirit being. He's the greatest creation. Isn't that interesting? In the Bible, the greatest creation is Satan, Lucifer. But no, no, no. The Archangel Michael is the greatest creation. He lowered himself to become Jesus of Nazareth. So notice when he was in a lower state, he rebuked the devil. Look at Matthew chapter 4, but notice when he's in this higher state, he did not dare to bring a judgment against him, the devil, in abusive terms, but said, may Jehovah rebuke you. Hmm, interesting. Let's compare that to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, understand Joshua is the English rendering of Jehoshua, and Eesus, Jesus, is the what? Koine Greek rendering of Yahushua, Joshua. So he, and he showed me Jesus, right? The high priest standing before the angel of Jehovah. And again, they believe that the angel of Jehovah is the archangel Michael. We know as traditional Christians, they're distinct. The archangel Michael is a created spirit being. The angel of Jehovah, the messenger of Jehovah, is the eternal divine son who took on flesh. Anyway, before the angel of Jehovah and Satan was standing at his right hand to resist him, to resist the angel of Jehovah. And the angel of Jehovah said to Satan, may Jehovah rebuke you, O Satan. Yes, may Jehovah, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this one a burning log snatched out of the fire? So you say, see, that proves it. When you look at Jude and you compare it to Zechariah chapter 3 here, notice the archangel Michael is interacting with the devil and Jehovah, excuse me, the angel of Jehovah is interacting with Satan and they're kind of saying the same thing. Here's the problem. That's another lie, mistranslation of the watchtower. Notice it wasn't uh, the angel, remember it was the angel of Jehovah and then the angel of Jehovah didn't say, may Jehovah rebuke you. Jehovah said, may Jehovah rebuke you proving that the angel of Jehovah is Jehovah. Notice how they're so wicked. They change things. Again, in the Koine Greek, right, the Septuagint, written 200 years before the time of Lord Jesus by Greek-speaking Jewish scribes, right, Old Testament scholars. Notice, Agelu Kirio is there. And what he says, que ipen Kirios proston diabolon. Kirios, right? So notice, the angel of the Lord is there, and then who speaks is the Lord. So what does that show? The angel of the Lord is the Lord. Notice how they changed it. They changed the second Lord saying to the devil, right? I rebuke you. The Lord rebukes you. They changed it wickedly to the angel of the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. Notice how wicked. Wicked people lie. That's a lie. Revelation chapter 2 verse 9, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who call themselves Jews and really are not, 
but they are a synagogue of Satan. So notice, those, forgive me, who call themselves Jews are not truly Jews. Jews are those who accepted their divine Messiah. So the traditional Christians are the children of Israel spiritually, are the Jews spiritually. So those who call themselves Jews but are not, who are not a synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, I know where you are dwelling. These are to these seven churches uh, that uh, St. John's writing to. That is where the throne of Satan is, says Pergamon. And yet you keep holding fast to my name, and you did not deny, notice whose name, to the name of the Lord Jesus, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed by your side where Satan is dwelling. All right, so this is kind of an interesting graphic here. You'll see Potmos there. Notice it's an island very close to the coast of Asia Minor. Minor, you see Potmos that's mentioned in Revelation chapter one, verse nine, and there are those seven churches, beginning in Ephesus, then Smyrna, then Pergamum, which is what we were just referring to there, then Thyatira, then Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So notice the seven churches kind of make a little circuit starting in Ephesus. And by the way, who ended up being in Ephesus was St. John, and he uh, took care of the Theotokos there. So. Now there is, as an example, there's where Ankara is and there's where Constantinople is. And notice Satan's in Pergamum. There's where Pergamum is. And by the way, this is the temple of Pergamum, the temple of Zeus, basically a temple of Satan that was uh, transported from Pergamum to Berlin. So that's in Berlin. So that's what that structure, the temple of basically Satan, appeared like. Notice they obviously did a, an amazing job of recreating it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Look, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews yet or not, see the same type of wording, but are lying. Look, I will make them come and bow before your feet and make them know that I have loved you. And Lord Jesus speaking. And again, it doesn't say bow before your feet. It doesn't say obeisance. It says worship. So he's mocking them. He's like, you won't worship me. I'm going to make you worship my children, my brothers, those who I love. He's basically, he's mocking them. It's like, oh, really? You won't worship me? You know what I'm going to do to you? You're going to end up worshiping the true Jews, the true Israelites, to mock them. Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 3 and 4. Another sign was seen in heaven. Look, a great fire-colored dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its head seven diadems, seven crowns, and its tail drags a third of the stars of heaven, and it hurled them down to the earth. This is where the thought of the a third of the angelic host fell to earth following, being tricked by Lucifer, Satan. And the dragon kept standing before the woman. This woman was mentioned in verses 1 through 2, and it's obviously a reference to Mary the Theotokos, who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. So notice, Satan, it appears, was involved with what Herod did to the two-year-olds and younger in Bethlehem. So notice it's kind of you know cryptic language because obviously that didn't happen as soon as the child was born. It was when the child was two years old. But again, Satan wanted to kill Lord Jesus and appears was involved with what Herod did so wickedly. Same chapter, verses 7 through 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels battled with the dragon, and the dragon and its angels battled, but they did not prevail. So notice Michael the archangel, who is not the same thing as the angel of Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, who is not Lord Jesus Christ, controls angelic hosts in heaven, battling in heaven. So notice, Michael is the captain of the host of the Lord's armies in heaven during spiritual battles in heaven, not on earth. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them any longer in heaven. So down the great dragon was hurled, the original serpent, the one called devil and Satan. So there it compares it right there. So obviously this dragon is the serpent, is the devil is Satan. So now going back to Genesis chapter 3, that serpent is the devil, is Satan. It's right there. Who is misleading the entire inhabited earth. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. Continuing verses 10 through 12. I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come to pass the salvation, the power, the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ, because the accuser of our brother, Satan, has been hurled down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they conquered him because of the blood of the Lamb, and because of the word of their witnessing, and they did not love their souls, even in the face of death. On this account, be glad you heavens and you who reside in them. Woe for the earth and for the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great anger, knowing that he has a short period of time. Has this already happened? Is this going to happen in the future? 
Now, what's interesting is notice in verse 11, and they conquered him. So these are the angelic hosts conquering Satan. This is, a, this is an angelic battle in heaven, right? Michael and the quote-unquote good angels fighting Satan, the serpent, the dragon, Lucifer, and the bad angels. And notice, because of the blood of the lamb. So even the sacrifice of, of Lord Jesus even affected events in the spiritual realm. Okay, but notice this. They did not love their souls. So they have angelic souls, even in the face of death. So can angels die? This is incredible. And what does death mean in, in angels? Like a lot of this spiritual stuff is not really spoken about in, in Scripture. Just tiny little allusions to that. And again, when the devil does come down the earth, he's going to have great anger. Is this what's happening now? Because it's coming. If it's not already happening now, it's coming. Hasn't been happening for a while. Who knows? It is coming if it's not already here. And, and obviously, if you have eyes to see, you can see as we're marching towards this. Continuing, verses 13 to 15, And when the dragon saw that it had been hurled down to the earth, it persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Well, that just can't be Mary anymore. So is this the church? What the thought is it's the church. But the two wings of the great e eagle were given to the woman so that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she used to be fed for a time and times and half a time away from the face of the serpent. So what does that refer to? And the serpent spewed out water like a river from its mouth after the woman to cause her to be drowned by the river. So notice there's this serpent spewing out water to drown the woman. What's interesting about that? Is if you could look at Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, we looked at uh, starting in verse 3 earlier, and he showed me a river of water of life. This is in the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, clear as crystal, flowing, a different kind of river, right? That's a river of death that we're seeing there in verse 15. This is a river of eternal life flowing out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Again, one throne, Almighty God's on it and the Lamb. Down the middle of its main street on both sides of the river were trees of life, producing 12 crops of fruit, yielding their fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Uh, verse 16 and 17 of Revelation 12, But the earth came to the woman's help, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon spewed up its, from its mouth. Again, what does that mean? So the dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to wage war with the remaining ones of her offspring who observed the commandments of God and have the work of bearing witness concerning Jesus. So what does all this refer to spiritually in terms of end times? Because it's either here, it's coming for sure. Now let's look into Revelation chapter 13, starting verse 1. And it stood on the sand of the sea. That it is the dragon. And I saw a wild beast ascending out of the seas, the beast of the seas, the Antichrist, son of perdition, with ten horns and seven heads. Notice the dragon had ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns ten diadems. So notice there is a difference here. So notice this wild beast, this beast of the sea, right? This son of perdition is very similar to its spiritual father, right? It also has ten horns and seven heads. What's the distinction? The serpent, the dragon of Revelation 12, had seven diadems on its seven heads. This wild beast, beast of the sea, son of perdition, right? Antichrist has ten diadems on its ten horns, but on its head blasphemous names. Now the wild beast that I saw was like a leopard, but its feet were like those of a bear, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and the dragon gave to the beast its power and its throne and great authority. I don't show this, but if you look at the reference of the leopard and the bear and the lion, and even the uh, seven heads and ten horns, go back and look at um, the beasts described in uh, Daniel. I saw that one of its heads seemed to have been fatally wounded, but its mortal wound had been healed, and all the earth followed the wild beast with admiration. So what does this mean? Continuing verses 4 through 8. And they worshipped. Oh, worship? Worship? Worship's only due to God. Notice how they don't talk about Jesus being worshipped, even though he was, but the dragon is being worshipped. Huh. And the beast of the sea is being worshipped. Why would the Watchtower translators do this? And they worshipped the dragon because they gave authority of the wild beast and they worshipped the wild beast with the word. Not did obeisance bow down. Remember, they did obeisance and bowed down to Lord Jesus Christ, the God man. No, we're going to change that. We're going to change the proskinison there, but we're going to keep it worship here. Wicked, demonic, evil. So they're worshipping the devil. They're worshipping the wild beast. And the New World translators are using the word worship, which they should, by the way. 
with the words, who is like the wild beast and who can do battle with it. It was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and it was given authority to act for 42 months, right, three and a half years, and it opened its mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his dwelling place, even those residing in heaven. It was permitted, oh, look, residing in heaven, spirits in heaven, see, right there, oh. Notice all, when you read the Bible, even the wicked mistranslation of the NWT, the truth just comes right out. They are the spirits, so you do not cease to exist after your physical body dies, no one does. The righteous, neither the unrighteous. It was permitted to wage war with the holy ones and conquer them on earth, of course. And it was given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And all those who dwell on the earth will worship it. From the founding of the world, not one of their names has been written in the scroll of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. Now that's fascinating. Because we're going to get into this whole idea of names written in the scroll of life. Notice these wicked people are worshiping it. And their names were not even written in the scroll of life. Fascinating. Why is that so fascinating? And again, there's the worship. Proskinisan, proskinisan. Worship. Notice how it's used for worship here, how it's used for worship, but then in other places, it's translated as bow down or did obeisance or whatever. Exodus chapter 32. However, Jehovah said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will wipe him out of my book. So notice who's doing the wiping? It's Jehovah. And notice, what does this teach? That everyone's name is written in the book of life. And when they cross a certain spiritual point, their names are blotted out. Their names are wiped out. But what do we see there in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8? They're these particular wicked people who are worshiping in these end times, the dragon, and worshiping his son, right? The son of perdition, the wild beast, the antichrist, their names were not even written in that book. Fascinating. Psalm chapter 9, verse 5. You have rebuked nations and destroyed the wicked. Again, referring to Jehovah, blotting out their name forever and ever. So you notice blotting out their names. So everyone's name is in the book, book of life, and then wicked people are blotted out. But these particular wicked people were never even written in it to begin with. Wow. Psalm chapter 69, verse 28. Let them be erased from the book of the living, and may they not be enrolled among the righteous. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, Yes, I request you also as a true fellow worker to keep assisting these women who have striven side by side with me for the good news, along with Clement, as well as the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, The one who conquers, this is Lord Jesus speaking, the Lamb, will thus be dressed in white garments, and I will by no means by no means, excuse me, blot out his name for the book of life, but I will acknowledge his name before my father and before the angels. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We saw in the Old Testament, it's Jehovah who blots out names. Well, guess what? The Lamb's doing it. Why? Because the Son is also Jehovah, like his Father. It's kind of like a family name. God is a family. God is love. It's a perfect, divine, eternal family. The Father's always been a father because he's always had a son. The Son's always been the son because he's always had a father. Okay? The Holy Trinity, God, is a family. God is one, one family, one divine being. That's three divine persons, Father and Son and spirit, all sharing the family name of Jehovah. Notice, I will, the lamb stating this, I will not blot their names out. But wait, Jehovah blots their names out. Yes, that's right. How can this be? Because the lamb, because the divine son who took on flesh is also Jehovah, just like his father and their spirit. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. I saw heaven open, and look, a white horse, and the one seated on it is called Faithful and True. Obviously, this is the Lamb, and he judges and carries on worn righteousness. Obviously, who does the judgment? The Son. There's, this is what the Bible teaches. And even though the watchtower wickedly altered the Bible, the truth is still there for those who have eyes to see. And he judges and carries on worn righteousness. His eyes are a fiery flame, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but he himself. He is clothed in outer garment stained with blood. He is called by the name the Word of God. Again, in, in, in John chapter 1, when they say the Word was God and with God, here he is. It's Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son who took on flesh. Notice the idea of his outer garment stained with blood. That's even a reference back to Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, where there's a prophecy of the Shiloh, the Messiah, to come. And his garments are stained with the blood of grapes. Also, the armies in heaven were following him. You're going to notice that these armies in heaven are not angelic spirit beings. They're saved humanity and glorified spiritual flesh and bone bodies like Lord Jesus currently has on earth, battling armies on earth, human armies on earth being... So basically, it's humans battling other humans on earth. There's humans supported by 
right? The lamb and these humans have to be glorified uh, 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 believers, saved humanity, the bride of Christ, by the way. And then there's the sons of the serpent. These ones who are so wicked to worship the beast that their names were even never written in the book of life. They're on white horses and they were clothed in white, clean, fine linen. Pay attention to these details. And out of his mouth protrudes a sharp, long sword. So notice the lamb is carrying a sword as he uh, leads the armies of heaven on earth. Not like the Archangel Michael leading armies in heaven, which are angelic spirit beings in battle in heaven, the spiritual realm. Uh, proceeds a sharp, long sword with which to strike the nations, and he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. Moreover, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his outer garment, yes, on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, these, these are the armies of the kings of the earth, will battle with the Lamb, but because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, just like we see in Revelation 19, 16, the Lamb will conquer them. Also, those with them, pay attention, who are called and chosen and faithful will do so. So they're called and chosen, and then they're faithful. Notice in Revelation 19, 11, the one seated on the white horse is faithful and true, okay? And notice the called and chosen in the Koine Greek is klitoi ke ek, ek lektoi. Klitoi ke ek lektoi. Called and chosen. Matthew 22. This is uh, the end of verse 14. This is the end of a parable of Lord Jesus talking about what? The king in heaven having uh, his son get married. And then there's an individual who doesn't have a wedding garment and is thrown out. And then... Matthew twenty two fourteen. For there are many invited, but few chosen. But it's not invited; it's called. It's called and chosen. Klitoi ke eklektoi. Okay, so there's a. I don't know if that's purposeful, but that's a bad translation because then you don't see who these individuals are. So in those, these are the guests at the wedding of the Lamb. They're called and chosen. And who in Revelation seventeen fourteen are those with? The lamb, as he battles the kings of the earth and the battles the armies of the beast of the sea and the false prophet, they're called and chosen. Oh, this is the exact name of these wedding guests and faithful. Hey, wait a minute. This is the bride of Christ and they're going to marry the lamb and his name is faithful. And when a bride marries a man, the bridegroom, they take his name, his name faithful. Oh, they're called and chosen and faithful. That's why I say who they are. Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. In response, one of the elders said to me, this is the great crowd, those who are dressed in the white robes. Who are they and where did they come from? So right away I said to him, my Lord, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, these are the ones who came or come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is saved humanity after the quote-unquote rapture event. And now they're in glorified spiritual flesh and bone, immortal and corruptible bodies, in heaven. And then they marry the lamb in Revelation uh, 19. We're going to see it here. And then they come down, I guess, on their honeymoon with the lamb to destroy the beasts of the sea, the kings of the earth, etc. Let us rejoice and be overjoyed and give him glory because the marriage of the lamb has arrived and his wife has prepared herself. Notice how the wife is dressed. Yes, but it's granted her to be clothed with bright, clean, fine linen, exactly how the armies of heaven are described later in this chapter. For the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the holy ones and he, or the saints. And he tells me, right, happy are those invited to the evening meal of the Lamb's marriage. It's almost identical to what we see wording um, in Matthew 22. Also, he tells me these are the true sayings of God. Very important, true sayings of God. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. So notice this is Joshua, human ruler, Jesus, by the way, right? Um, he's going to lead the armies of Israel against these wicked human armies of Jericho. So when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. Ooh, a man with a sword in his hand. Joshua walked to him and said, Are you on our side or on the side of our adversaries? To this he said, No, but I have come as prince of Jehovah's army. So notice, this individual who looks like a man with a sword is 
the host of Jehovah's army on earth. Hey, who's Jehovah's armies on earth? It's going to be the Israelites. Do you see? And again, this is the pre-incarnate son. With that, Joshua fell on his face to the ground, prostrated himself, basically worshiping him. Said to him, what does my Lord have to say to his servant? The prince of Jehovah's armies replied to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet because the place where you stand, or you're standing, excuse me, is holy. At once Joshua did so. And this is exactly what the angel of the Lord toward Moses in, uh, told Moses in Exodus chapter 3 speaking out of the burning thorn bush. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3 here. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven with the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, the original serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he hurled him into the abyss, to that pit, and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not mislead the nations anymore until the thousand years were released. After this, he must be released for a little while. There it is. That's what's being referred to in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15. Instead, you were brought down to the grave, to Hadei Sheol, to not just a grave like an earthly pit, to the remote parts of the pit of the abyss, a spiritual dimension. Continue Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and notice plural, and those who sat on them were given authority to judge. So more than one person, multiple persons, and they're being given authority by someone else to judge. Yes, I saw the souls of those executed for a witness they give about Jesus. There he is, they're seeing spirits. This laughably pathetic false theology taught by the Watchtower that when you die, you cease to exist. Really, he's seeing spirits, he's seeing souls. Yes, I saw the souls of those executed for the witness they gave about Jesus and for speaking about God and those who had not worshiped the wild beast or its image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and ruled as kings with Christ for a thousand years. Let's continue and finish this off and then come back and find out who are these people. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. For them, happy and holy is anyone having part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of the Christ, and they will rule as kings with him for their thousand years. First off, the idea of a first resurrection. This is not the only first resurrection. This is the first resurrection for these people. You have one first resurrection if you're saved, right? If you're unsaved, you never get a first resurrection. There's no second resurrection because all you get is a first resurrection. Now, the first first resurrection was Lord Jesus, right? After the three days. The second first resurrection happened at the rapture. And we saw the end results of that in Revelation chapter 7. So who are these people? Okay, so they can't be the people of the great crowd. They have to be others. So these had to be people who at the time of the rapture event were not believers and yet thereafter became believers, right? And after this point became believers witnessed about Jesus, spoke about God, and refused to worship the wild beast or its image and never received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. So who are these people? Well, I'm not gonna get into it that much, but you have the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 17 and the 144,000, which we are gonna talk about. And I believe, again, God's never gonna leave the earth without someone to spread the gospel. So the two witnesses and their 144,000 helpers spread the gospel in Jerusalem, baby, in Israel. And these people who call themselves Jews, many of them finally recognize that Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah and come back to Jesus. And these are the individuals, sons of Israel, right? Physical descendants of Israel, or so they believe. Um, happy and holy is anyone having part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of the Christ, and they will rule as kings with him for the thousand years. So this is on the earth. They're going to rule on the earth for a thousand years. So notice, and you're gonna see it, it, this is gonna include the 144,000. So notice that everything is backwards. The great crowd is in heaven, although they do come to earth as the armies of heaven to destroy the armies of the kings of the earth, the beast of the sea and the false prophet, which we already saw. This 144,000, and, and they get other sons of Israel to believe uh, upon Lord Jesus, they rule on earth for a thousand years. Notice everything's backwards. Matthew chapter 19, remember the idea of the thrones and those given authority to judge. Verses 27 to 30, then Peter said and replied, look, we have left all things and followed you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the recreation, right, when the Son of Man sits down on his glorious throne, you will have 
followed me will sit on 12 thrones, ooh, multiple thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Oh, multiple thrones, and they're giving authority to judge. And who does who they're tri- judging? The 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children's or land for the sake of my name will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit everlasting life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Notice verse 29, it's a hundred times as much, and this could be coincidental, but notice that's a multiple of 10, and they're going to be ruling for a thousand years in Revelation chapter 20, another multiple of 10. Look at verse 30, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. What am I suggesting? That those individuals' rulings as kings and priests with the Christ on earth for a thousand years were basically sons of Israel, physical descendants, who, because of the witnesses, the two witnesses, and the 144,000 helpers, we're going to look more into that here coming up, they basically became believers in Lord Jesus. So notice, many who are first will be last. So notice, who is the first people to get the gospel, if you want to think of it? What what was through Abraham? So children of Israel. So the sons of Israel were the first, and they're going to also be the last. So the first believers in the true God are up being the last believers of the true God. And the last, those last believers in the true God will be first in that they're going to be the first people to rule with their Messiah on earth for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 7, now getting into that 44,000, verses 3 through 8, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until after we have sealed the slaves of our God in their forts. So notice the wrath of God is going to begin after the servants are sealed. So doesn't that suggest that This sealing has something to do with the wrath because it's going to protect them against the wrath you're going to see. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. That's what it says. Out of the tribe of Judah, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Asher, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Levi, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. Who are these people? They have to be Old Testament saints, right? How would you find 12,000, you're going to see virginal males of the tribe of Naphtali now, right? These are individuals who were, you're going to see righteous people, righteous Old Testament saints who were of these tribes. That's what it states. By the way, this is happening in heaven and you're going to see they're going to go down to earth. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw, look, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. So he's in heaven, and with him 144,000 who have his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And they are singing what seems to be a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to master that song except the 144,000 who have been bought from the earth. So they were spirits in heaven bought from the earth to heaven. These are the ones who did not defile themselves with women, virgins. In fact, they are virgins. These are the ones who keep following the Lamb no matter where he goes. They were bought from among mankind as first fruits of God into the Lamb, and no deceit was found in the mouse. They are without blemish. So what these were, and I'm not really going to go into this video. I do in other videos, and Lord willing, I'll bring it up again in the future with more detail. But basically, these were, again, 12,000 per 12 tribes of Israel, Old Testament righteous saints who called on the name of the Lord, and they were kept in wait, in the zone of comfort, in Abraham's bosom, in Hades. This is described by Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 16 in a parable of Lazarus and the rich man. But what Lord Jesus is describing are things that exist. He never lies. He doesn't make things up like J.R.R. Tolkien. So those places he describes are real places and real things. So when Lord Jesus preached to the spirits in prison for the three days, right, He, and when he told the good thief on the cross that I'll be with you in paradise, again, paradise, where these righteous spirits were kept in wait, at that time was in the zone of comfort, Abraham's bosom, in Hades. Now, of course, it's in the third heaven. So when he ascended to the Father prior to uh, first uh, interacting with the um, uh, disciples minus Thomas, right, as he described to Mary Magdalene, it appears he carried with him, as kind of spoils of victory, these spirits with him and that's what it means these were bought from among mankind as first fruits to god and to the lamb and no deceit was found on the mouse they were without blemish they're righteous perfected spirits this is described in hebrews chapter 12. now how do i know they come to earth remember they were a seal was placed before the wrath began so when you and it's to protect them 
The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw this is the fifth trumpet judgment. I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to the earth, and the key to the shaft of the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft of the abyss, and the smoke ascended out of the shaft like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun was darkened also the air, but the smoke of the shaft, and locusts came out of the smoke unto the earth, and authority was given to them, the same authority that the scorpions of the earth have. They were told not to harm the vegetation of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people, pay attention, who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So there's going to be people on the earth who are going to be protected from this wrath, from the fifth trumpet judgment. Who are these people? Oh, they're going to be people of the seal of God on their foreheads. Who are those? The only group described thus is 144,000. And notice it was placed before the wrath to protect them. They come down to earth. Here they are. This, I believe, is being described in Ezekiel 37. Because remember, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15 or 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, when they describe that first resurrection event, that rapture event, it's occurring in the clouds. Notice this, verses 11 through 14. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Here they are saying, our bones are dry. This is on the land, on the earth, and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. So prophesy and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord Jehovah says. I will open your graves and raise you up from your graves, my people, and bring you to the land of Israel, and you will have to know that I am Jehovah. When I open your graves, when I raise you up out of your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit in you, will come to life, and I will settle you on your land. Remember, they're going to rule probably in Jerusalem for a thousand years with the Messiah. And you have to know that I myself, Jehovah, have spoken, and I have done it, declares Jehovah. So there's a resurrection happening, but it's happening on the ground. Revelation chapter 20 again, verses 7 through 10. Now, as soon as the thousand years have ended, Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to mislead those nations. Notice this is happening on the earth, not in heaven. The four corners of the earth, see, Gog and Magon, to gather them together for the war. The number of these is as the sand of the sea. And they advanced over the whole earth and circled the camp of the holy ones. So the 144,000 and those others that underwent the first resurrection we saw earlier in this chapter, they're on the earth ruling. It's right there. And the beloved city, Jerusalem, of course. But fire came down of heaven, consumed them. Remember the fire consumes? We saw that in Ezekiel 28. And the devil who was misleading them, notice right after it talks about fire coming down from heaven, consuming them. And the devil who was misleading these people. So what happens to him? Was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur, Gehenna, final hell, outer darkness, where both the wild beast and the false prophet already were. What? And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice again, that proves another false teaching, the Watchtower of Annihilation. Notice they will be tormented. This is the thousand years. Who was first thrown into this lake of fire, right, at the end of Revelation 19? It was the wild beast and the false prophet. This is a thousand years later, and they will be tormented? This is three people. So what does that tell you? What does that prove to you? Oh, the wild beast and the false prophet were still there after a thousand years of burning, no annihilation. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 to 19. Here it is. Because of your great guilt and your dishonest trading, you have profaned your sanctuaries. I will cause a fire out in your midst and it will consume you. We just saw almost the same words. I'll reduce you to ashes on the earth before all those looking at you. You mean like these kings that he tricked, Gog, Gog and Magog? All who knew you among the peoples, these peoples like the sand of the earth encircling the camp of the Holy Ones, Jerusalem, will stare at you in amazement. Your end will be sudden and terrible and you will cease to exist for all time. All time on earth. You're not going to be on earth ever again. You're going to be in the outer darkness forever. It's right there. Continuing, finishing off Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and the one seated on it. This is the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. From before him, the earth and the head fled away, and no place was found for them. What? So that's Lord Jesus on the great white throne, the throne of judgment, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. From before him, the earth and the heaven, that's the physical dimension, earth, the spiritual dimension, heaven, they're fleeing from his face and no place was found for them. He's destroying them right there. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, or the great and the small, standing before the throne and scrolls were opened, but another scroll was opened as the scroll of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead in it and death and the grave, you know, Sheol Hades gave up the dead in them and they were judged individually according to their deeds and death and the grave were hurled into the lake of fire. This means the second death, the life of the fire because all of us have a first death but only these people have a second death, right? Only we will have a first resurrection. There is no second resurrection. Furthermore, whoever was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire. Again, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 33, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit down on his glorious throne, right? Great white throne. 
all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another. This is the last day, the final judgment. Just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he put the sheep on his right hand, put the goats on his left. And we're seeing it play on Revelation chapter 20 right there. Second Peter verse uh, chapter 3, forgive me, verses 10 through 12. Again, showing, again, more wickedness of Watchtower translators and again, how it's Lord Jesus destroying the current heaven and earth. But Jehovah's day will come as a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, but the elements being intensely hot will be dissolved and earth in the works and it will be dis exposed. Uh, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, consider what sort of people you ought to be and holy acts of conduct and deeds of godly devotion. So you know, if we're covetous about the things of this earth, everything is going to be destroyed. And then there's going to be a creation of a new heaven, a new earth. We see that in Revelation 21. As you await and keep close in mind the presence of the day of Jehovah, the through which the heavens will be destroyed in flames and the elements will melt in the intense heat. So notice it's Jehovah's day coming as the thief in verse 10, and then it's the day of Jehovah in verse 12. Here's the problem. If you look at the coin in Greek, that's not what it says. It says the day of the Lord in verse 10 that comes as a thief, imerikirio os kleptis, like kleptomania. And then in verse 12, it's the day of God, theu imeras. And by the way, who's the day of the Lord that comes as a thief? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, verse 43 to 44, if there's the Lord Jesus speaking about these end times, but no one thing, if the householder had known in what watch the thief was coming, he would have kept awake and not allowed his house to be broken into. On this account, you two prove yourselves ready because the Son of Man is coming as an hour like a thief that you do not think to be it. Look at the wickedness, horrible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Now, as for the times and seasons, brothers, this is about the second coming of Lord Jesus, by the way, you need nothing to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that Jehovah's Day, again, it's the Lord's Day, is coming exactly as a thief as a night. Again, it's, look at the wickedness. The Lord being referred to as the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do you know that? Remember, we artificially break these uh, 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 epistles into chapters. So, chapter 5, verse 1, comes right after the end of chapter 4. What happens at the end of chapter 4? Oh, just the rapture event. Uh, verses 14 through 18. For if we have faith that Jesus died and rose again, so too God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in death through Jesus. It doesn't say in death, it just falls in sleep. For this is what we tell you by Jehovah's word, that we, the living who survived the presence of the Lord, and this Lord is Lord Jesus, will in no way precede those who have fallen asleep in death. Again, death is not in the Greek, because the Lord himself, this is the Lord Jesus, will come descend from heaven with a commanding call, with an archangel's voice. We're going to see whose voice is being uh uh, 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 called out at this time because it's not Lord Jesus' voice because he's not an archangel. It's other archangels. We're going to see that coming up with God's trumpet. And those who are dead in union with Christ will rise first. That's the dead bodies. That dead is there in the Greek. Afterward, we the living who are surviving will together with them be caught away in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. So keep comforting one of these words. We learn more about this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So again, Notice it's Lord Jesus descending with these spirits, right? And then the dead bodies rise, meet their corresponding spirits in the air, are converted in a twinkling. You see this in 1 Corinthians 15 into these glorified spiritual bodies. And then we rise and we're changed. Notice these bodies are being changed in the air, in the clouds, unlike what we saw happening in Ezekiel 37. Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, then I saw and look, a white cloud and seated on the cloud was someone like a son of man. There's Lord Jesus coming to reap the righteous with a golden crown in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Here he comes in the clouds. Another angel emerged from the temple sanctuary calling with a loud voice. Whoa, whoa, hold on. The calling with a loud voice, the archangel's voice is not the son of man on the cloud. It's another angel calling with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud. Put your sickle in and reap because the hour has come to reap for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And the one seated on the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth and the earth was reaped. Notice, Lord Jesus, son of man, is not speaking. Who's calling out in a loud voice is this other angel. Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 to 16. And I saw three unclean and inspired expressions, spirits, that look like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the wild beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are in fact expressions, spirits, inspired by demons and they perform signs and they go out to the kings of the entire inhabited earth to gather them together to the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Look, I'm coming as a thief. Who fights in that battle of Armageddon? Lord Jesus, there it is again. Look, the wickedness and stupidity of these Watchtower translators. 
Happy is the one who stays awake and keeps his outer garments so that he may not walk naked and people look upon his shamefulness. And they gather them together to the place that is called in Hebrew Armageddon. And we saw in Revelation 19 who comes down with the armies of heaven to destroy them because it's not the Father, it's the Lamb. That's the Lord who comes as a thief, obviously, no doubt. Hebrews chapter 1, again, showing how it's Lord Jesus destroying the heaven and earth. Verses 10 through 12, go study this. This is the Father speaking to the Son and saying to the Son, starting in verse 10, and at the beginning, O Lord, he just called the Son Kyrios, which is how the Greek-speaking Jews would call Jehovah. So at the beginning, O Jehovah, right? Because you're my son. You share the family name. You laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. Again, proving that the Son is creator, not a tool of the Father. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out. And you will wrap them up just as a cloak and as a garment, they will be changed. So notice, who's destroying the heaven and earth? It's the Son. And you, the Son, will wrap them up just as a cloak and as a garment, they will be changed. Because again, there's a creation of a new heaven and new earth with the descent of new Jerusalem in uh, the beginning of Revelation 21. But you are the same, and your ears, ears will never come to an end. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. According to the undeserved kindness of God that was given to me, I laid a foundation, this is St. Paul, as a skilled master builder, but someone else is building on it. But let each one keep watching how he's building on it. For no one can lay any other foundation than what is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ, obviously the foundation of our life. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, builds on the teachings and the discipleship, and the seeing and believing upon Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, as Thomas so appropriately uh, uh, saw after seeing Lord Jesus in his resurrected physical body. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, those are works that have meaning or worth to God. Wood, hay, or straw, these are works in our lives that have no meaning to God. Each one's work will be shown for what it is. For the day, that final day, the day of judgment, will be shown for what it is. Oh, show it up, forgive me, because it will be real by means of fire. So notice all of us are going to pass through the fire. The fire to the saved, what's it going to do to us? And the fire itself will prove what sort of work each one has built. Now, we're, we're going to be judged by works in terms of getting rewards. They're going to judge in terms of the works in, in terms of getting judgment. So notice all of us walk through fire. They walk through the fire and end up in Gehenna, eternal fire. We walk through a fire and and we end up in the new heaven, the new earth, new Jerusalem. And if we did works of value to God, they come with us. If anyone's work that he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward in the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. If anyone's work is burned up, these are works that don't have any worth to God, he will suffer loss. He's not going to get a reward, but he himself will be saved. Yet if, if so, it will be as through fire. See how all this, see the beautiful connection of the Bible message. Revelation chapter 2. Verse uh, 18, to the angel of the congregation Thyatira write, these are the things that the Son of God says, the one who has eyes like a fiery flame and his feet are like fine copper. Notice in Revelation 20 verse 11, that's the Son of Man sitting on that throne and from his face the heaven and the earth fled away and there's no place found for them and they burn up. Well, guess what? His eyes are like a fiery flame, right? <laughs> so before his fiery eyes, they're destroyed by fire. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. I turned, this is St. John speaking on Patmos, to see who was speaking with me. It's the Lamb. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstand, someone like a son of man, the son of man, the Lord Jesus, clothed in a garment, pay attention how he's dressed, that reached down to his feet and wearing a golden sash around his chest. Moreover, his head and his hair were white as white wool, as snow in his eyes were like a fiery flame. There it is again. And his feet were like the fine copper when glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel the prophet, and I kept watching until thrones, plural, were set in place, and the Ancient of Days, right, Jehovah, sat down. Notice how he looks. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head was like clean wool. His throne was flames of fire, flames of fire again. Its wheels were burning fire. So notice when St. John saw Lord Jesus, he looked just like the Ancient of Days. He looked just like his father. He's the image of God. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, above the expanse that was over their heads, there's the cherubim, was what looked like a sapphire stone. It resembled a throne. Sitting on the throne up above was someone whose appearance resembled that of a human. I saw something glowing like a lectrum. A lectrum's kind of a golden amber brass color that was like a fire radiant from what appeared to be his waist and upward from his waist down. I saw something that resembled fire. There was a brilliance all around him. So if you compare what Lord Jesus appeared to St. John on Patmos 
in Revelation 1 to what we see here in Ezekiel 1 and we, what we just saw there in um, uh, Isaiah, excuse me, Daniel chapter 7. Forgive me. That's just that notice. Lord Jesus is appearing just like his father did in the Old Testament right there. Hebrews chapter 1. Why? Verses, uh, verse 3. Pay attention to this. He is the reflection of God's glory. Wait a minute. It was the anointed cherub Lucifer, Satan, who reflected God's glory. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact reputation of his very being. Look at what that's saying, even in their wicked translation, the exact representation of his very being, the being of Almighty God. What's the being of Almighty God? Well, divine, uh, beginningless, eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, um, omnipresent. He's the exact representation of that. Oh, so he has all those same characteristics. But those are characteristics of God and divinity. Well, he shares them. And he sustains all things by the word of his power. Notice that he sustains all things. The lamb, the son, sustains all creation by the word of his power. By the way, again, another false teaching that Lord Jesus ceased to exist for three days. Complete ludicrousness. But notice, if that happened, which of course it didn't happen, how was heaven and earth sustained if he didn't exist? Laughable. And after he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. By the way, in the Greek it says, by himself forgave our sins or purified our sins. Now, reflection of God's glory. Again, it's the beaming forth, the radiation. He doesn't reflect the glory. Like the moon reflects the light of the sun. He's beaming forth the glory. Do you see the lying, the wickedness? And it's pathetic. You can see it even in their own uh, uh, Greek manuscripts. They don't change those. So they're not reflecting the glory, which is, by the way, it appears what the covering cherub did that we saw back in Ezekiel 28, right? He's beaming forth. The glory's burnt. He is just like his father beams forth light. He, the son, beams forth light as well. He beams forth the glory of the father. Second Peter chapter 3, this time verses 5 through 7, for they deliberately ignored the, this fact that long ago there were heavens and an earth standing firmly out of water and in the midst of water by the word of God, Logos to Teu, right? Lord Jesus Christ, right? And that by those means the world of that time suffered destruction when it was flooded with water. But by the same word, the same Logos, Lord Jesus Christ, the heavens and the earth that now exist are reserved for fire and are being kept until the day of judgment and of destruction of the ungodly people. So notice, who sustains who reserves the current heaven and earth? Lord Jesus Christ. Who's going to destroy them? On the day of the Lord that comes is the, the day of God, Lord Jesus Christ, the design, divine Son who took on flesh. There it is, right? Tu theu loho. And then, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was toward the God or with God, and God was the Word. En aji ino logos, que logos in prostonteon, que theos. In Ologos, God was the Word. Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God. The Trinity is true. It's one being, one family, one Jehovah, the family name, Father, Son, and Spirit. The divine, eternal, beginningless, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent Son took on flesh in the person of Lord Jesus of Nazareth. Now he is in heaven as the Lamb, he has a glorified spiritual flesh and bone body, seeing and believing upon him, believing he is our Lord and our God, as Thomas declared in John chapter 20, Kyrios mu ke theos mu. And did Lord Jesus rebuke him? No. He says, since you have seen, you believe. Since you have seen what? Since you have seen, I am your Lord and your God. Why, Thomas? How have you seen that I'm your Lord and your God? I resurrected myself like I promised, and I just materialized myself in this room with your other fellow disciples. I am your Lord, I am your God. You saw, you believed. Blessed are those who do not see him resurrect physically, who do not see him physically materialize in a room and yet believe, fulfilling the will of the Father, that he is our Lord, our God, the entire world. Jehovah's Witnesses, non-Jehovah's Witnesses alike. I pray I spoke truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.